Hey, what's up budget gamers? Today is an exciting day. It's the start of a running series here, all centered on this spinning pile of CPUs. Each of these CPUs was $20 or less delivered, and we're going to put them all through the ringer to see what, if any kind of gaming, can actually be done on them. We've got quad cores, we've got hexacores, we've got octa cores, and we even have a pair of deca cores. The best part? They all drop into readily available workstations for uber cheap gaming potential. To start, we're going to look at the gold standard of sub $20 gaming chips, the E5 2620 V3. This little Haswell chip has been a sub $20 darling of budget X99 enthusiasts for at least three years, and it's easy to see why. It's got six cores, 12 threads, a 2.4 GHz base clock, a 3.2 GHz max turbo clock, and quad channel memory in a package with a TDP of just 85 watts. It's also available right now for about five US dollars shipped to your door. So let's get to the testing and ultimately find out, does it game? Starting off with the requisite e -peen synthetics, our wee baby 6 core puts up an 805 in Cinebench R15 Multi with a 124 single core score. Now how that'll stack up against the rest of the field in the end, who can actually say, but for now it slots in as the fastest and only CPU in both multi and single core scores. Moving ahead to 3D Mark Fire Strike, a slightly more gamery benchmark, and our Xeon scores over 10,000 in the physics test. Again, it's a little hard to say where this will ultimately fall in, but for now, it is head of the class. Without further ado, then, it's time for some real games. Little known fact international law actually requires CSGO and CPU testing. Now you know. Over a three-game stint, the 2620v3 puts up an adequate 209 FPS on average, with 1% lows just a shade under 97. This result is of course put to shame by newer, more expensive chips, and even by other chips on the same platform, but we are working with a $5 CPU here, and can chalk this up as a perfectly playable result. Everyone's most or least favorite esports title gives us another usable result, with just over 160 FPS on average, and a surprisingly good, for Fortnite anyway, 1% low of just about 60 FPS. If all you want to do is play free esports title, this is already a strong contender for a budget build. Continuing that trend, the little Xeon gives us another great result in Apex Legends, with an average frame rate over 120 and a 1% low of nearly 100, indicating we've got fantastic consistency in our frame pacing. Moving on from esports to more challenging titles, Ashes of the Singularity is one of the most brutal games anyone can throw at a CPU. Here, all things considered, although 2620 does okay, with an average result of 69 FPS in the in-game benchmark. Nice. Far Cry 5 sees our baby budget chip pushing just over 90 FPS on average with a minimum frame rate of 71 in the in-game benchmark. Considering this isn't a competitive multiplayer title, anything over 60 here is plenty for playability. Borderlands 3, well known for its ability to become a stuttery mess on lower end hardware, delivers not only a solid 140 FPS average, but even keeps the 1% lows in the 80s. Uh, it should be pointed out that this is a mixed benchmark with the average coming from the in-game and the 1% low figure coming from a 20 minute actual gameplay session. It's just the easiest way to get repeatable figures.
Shadow of the Tomb Raider has no problem utilizing all six cores to great effect, with the Xeon pushing over 120 on average in the benchmark run, with a minimum frame rate of 95. Forza Horizon 5, with its superb optimization, sees the little Xeon deliver a phenomenal 141 FPS on average, with even the minimum frame rate staying over 120. A result like this means that pairing this chip with even a mid-range GPU like, say, a 6750 XT, we could turn the settings up and probably still be GPU limited. That's not really bad for less than the price of a Big Mac. Last but not least, we come to Horizon Zero Dawn and its penchant for humiliating low-end hardware. But with an average over 120 and a 1% low of nearly 90, it's Xeon 1, Zero Dawn, Zero. This is in the same territory as Forza Horizon, where turning up the settings could easily result in a GPU bottleneck before a CPU one. Now, the benchmarks thus far have actually been pretty outstanding, at least for a $5 CPU, but things aren't all perfect here. A CPU like this almost necessitates using a Radeon of some sort, and as we cut back to Horizon Zero Dawn, this time in split screen, we can see why. Using the same settings on two different cards, neither the RX 5700 on the left nor the 1660 Super on the right are actually being fully utilized in these benchmark runs, so neither is the limiting factor. But let's freeze and take a look at the performance delta here. This discrepancy is down to a case of driver overhead, with Radeons being well known for having much less of it, and on a potato CPU like this it really shows. So while this chip is a fantastic value, and make no mistake that at $5 it absolutely does game, it's one that should really be paired with an AMD card to get the most out of it. With that, thanks for watching, mash the like button if you enjoyed, and don't forget to get subscribed to follow the rest of the CPU tests.